It's been a little while since we were in Revelation. Um, I was mentioning to someone earlier, if you have a, a good fever and then watch a bit of Star Wars and then read the book of Revelation, it's a, an interesting combo. Um, but we're in Revelation 13, so just a bit of a reminder about sort of our approach to the book. Um, so we acknowledged when we started that Revelation is a difficult book. So that means uh, we want to have a fair amount of humility, especially about arguing over every particular detail and what this particular thing must refer to. Um, we also notice that it, Revelation is an apocalypse, a, a revelation. So it's highly metaphorical. There's lots of pictures and images. So we should read with our imaginations. Uh, turned on and expect that there'll be lots of symbolism and not necessarily we're going to see a dragon with various numbers of heads physically. Um, we also noted back when we started that this is a biblical prophecy um, so it stands at the end of a long line of prophets and it uses imagery from the whole Bible but especially Daniel and Zechariah and Ezekiel. Um, so if you want to understand the images then you need to read your whole Bible, and especially read those prophets. Um, but we noticed also that Revelation is a letter, so it's written to seven churches, and this is helpful when you're figuring out how, how can I apply this, and it's all crazy, where well, you go back to those chapters in 2 and 3, and you see it's written to specific people with specific problems, churches uh, at, at the time, I think around 95, 96 AD. So it's a letter. We also notice that it repeats things a number of times. We have these cycles, and uh, we notice that Revelation was about Jesus. So as you come through, the first 11 chapters are sort of the, the church and the world. But now we're seeing behind the scenes from chapter 12 on. And we saw in chapter 12 that Satan is attacking the church, but he keeps failing because God preserves it. Um, but then Satan is not alone. He also has these other allies. And that's where we pick up um, with the dragon standing on the edge of the sea in Revelation 13. So let's pray and then we'll read together. <clears throat> well, Father, we pray that you would open our eyes and our hearts, that we might see wonderful things in this, your word. So, Lord, I pray for clarity, for uh, myself, I pray you keep a guard on my mouth that what I say would be profitable for your people. And we pray, Lord, that we all might submit to you and we might follow Christ with our whole hearts. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. So Revelation 13, uh, and uh, we'll read from, I suppose, 12, 17. Right at the end it says, then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he, that is the dragon, stood on the sand of the sea. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words. And it was allowed to exercise authority for forty-two months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling. That is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world 
in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword he must be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth that had two horns like a lamb and it spoke like a dragon that exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. <clears throat> and by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also, it causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is the name of the beast, or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six, six, six. Amen. Thus far the reading of God's uh, holy word. So uh, what do these countries have in, have in common? Afghanistan, North Korea, Somalia, Libya, Yemen, Eritrea, Nigeria, Pakistan, Iran and India. Uh, if you can answer that, what do they have in common? Well, uh, they are, according to, I think, the Open Doors, the top ten most dangerous countries to be a Christian. To openly practice your Christian faith in these countries is asking for death or imprisonment. So sometimes uh, the state opposes the church by the use of the sword. Uh, interestingly, Christianity is growing in many of these countries, uh, particularly, uh, for example, Nigeria. The church seems to be growing there. We could add to that list perhaps Persia, Babylon, ancient Rome, right? The Holy Roman Empire. These are various situations where the state explicitly resists the church and persecutes the church. And I would say those are manifestations of the beast of the sea from Revelation 13. But it's safe to say that explicit persecution doesn't always work. And, and persecution is not the only weapon in Satan's arsenal. There's also the beast of the earth that comes second. Where you have religious and economic pressures that come on the church. You know, I was uh, reading in the paper a few weeks ago about this uh, Bethlehem College stuff. And uh, they, have, they had this point, 13, in the document that stated, this is what... The paper said, marriage is an institution created by God in which one man and one woman enter into an exclusive relationship intended for life. And that marriage is the only form of partnership approved by God for sexual relations. It's fairly innocuous to us, right? The statement of belief about what marriage is. And then this guy Lockhart, who wrote to the Minister of Education, said the statement was discriminatory and illegal. Now, we're obviously not into bullying anyone and to mistreating people. But you see there's a pressure there, right? There's a pressure there. You can't believe what you believe. You need to conform to our way of thinking. So the, the church may face persecution uh, or pressure. Because Satan is both strong but he's also Sneaky is the direct and the indirect attack. And that's what we get a picture of here in Revelation 13. And, and we can be tempted either to give up out of fear or we can be deceived. 
And so we've got two points this morning that are relatively simple because the text is not that simple, but there are, the two points are simple. Firstly, we have to endure, endure persecution. We must endure persecution. And secondly, we must be wise. We must be wise. So we must endure persecution. If you look in your Bibles in verse 10, at the end of the verse, having described the first beast, it says, Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. So that this text is calling the saints, that is Christians, uh, that refers to all Christians, all Christians who are true Christians are saints, and this is a call to endurance and to faith. How does he get there? Well, look in verse 1. I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, and ten diadems on its horns, and blasphemous names on its heads. So this beast comes out of the sea, out of that place of sort of chaos and things that are fearful. And, and it comes out, and it has all of these heads and these horns and these crowns that it wants to rule. And it looks kind of like the creatures from Daniel 7 and 8. Uh, there, Daniel saw four creatures. And they represented different empires. I don't know if you can recall that. There was a lion, a bear, a leopard, and then uh, the one with teeth of iron. We talked about a, a scary robot with our kids when we read Daniel. But you have these four beasts, the last one being Rome. So when Babylon, Persia, Greek, and then Rome. But here, this one beast is, is sort of a, it's a, a mash together of all of those images, of all of those empires. It, it's a representation of military and political might. Especially the kind that, that always claims more and more for itself, right? That, that thinks of itself as great. And these powerful empires, they follow a pattern that's been repeated through history. From Alexander the Great to Joseph Stalin in Russia and everybody else in between. Political might that would oppose the church. And then you see there in verse 2, that, that, so it's this amalgam of a leopard and a bear and a lion's mouth. And the dragon gave it his power, his throne and great authority. The, the beast of the sea has satanic backing. It's from the dragon, from Satan. So we are not at war against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. And, uh, and you see that it sounds in some senses like Christ. If you look in verse 3, one of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound. But its mortal wound was healed and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. So I'm not certain of the precise fulfillment of uh, that There are various options. But uh, what is clear is that you have here a picture of the way that Satan works. He doesn't make up, he doesn't have his own things, right? He, only, he just messes other things up, right? And so here we have this beast is, is like Christ because he, he seems to be killed and then he's healed and everybody's amazed, right? Jesus, of course, truly died and then truly the land that was slain rose again. But this beast is, is sort of like that. And so they worship the dragon and because he gave authority to the beast. And then notice what they sing or they cry out. Who is like the beast? And who can fight against it? When people get uh, more and more power, they like to claim things that only God ought to claim, right? Because this is something that we sing about God again and again through Scripture. For example, Psalm 113. Who is like the Lord our God, seated on high? Or Exodus 15. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds? Or Psalm 89. Who is as mighty as you are, O Lord? So that the beast is a parody of Christ, claiming things that only God could claim. In short, he's, he's a blasphemer. And that's what you see in verse 5. And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words. And it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. So he, he's a blasphemer. He utters words that he ought not to utter, claiming things for himself that are not his to claim. 
And he's allowed to do this for 42 months. Now we've, we've seen this number a lot of times through Revelation, 42 months, or three and a half years, a, a half week of years, time, times, and half a time, all, I believe, referring to the time be between Christ's first coming and his second coming. In other words, he's ruling now. Now is the time that this beast is allowed to rule. And so he's, he's slandering, he's blaspheming, reviling, speaking disrespectfully, blaspheming God and heaven. And then in verse 7, it's allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. So there's little bits of hope in here as we look at something very scary. It's allowed to do these things. I think that implies that God allows this. It's not outside of God's control and His providence. And it's, and it's given, but it is given authority over every tribe and people and language and nation. Really, it's the Lamb who was slain who has that authority, doesn't it? But He's given this authority. And then uh, in verse 8, you see, And all who dwell on the earth, now that's a technical term, the earth dwellers, right? Those are those who don't follow the Lamb. Those are the, those are the ones who are, resist the Lamb. In verse 8, And everyone who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. So these earth dwellers are those whose name haven't been written in the Lamb's book of life from before the foundation of the world. So this does imply what we call double predestination. I don't know if you've heard of that term, but it does imply that God has indeed chosen those for salvation from before the foundation of the world who will be His and he's also so chosen those who will ultimately reject him. And that's what is taught here. And it's those people who are not true Christians who worship the beast. They love the beast. And then we're told to pay attention. Verse 9, if anyone has ears, let him hear. And then you have this little saying. If anyone is to be take, taken captive or imprisoned, to captivity he goes. And if anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword must he be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. What's going on here? What does he mean? Well, it's a call for endurance and faith for the saints. Right? Endurance is the capacity to, to hold out, to bear up in the face of difficulty. So we could, we could say it's patience or endurance, steadfastness, perseverance. And with faith, so trusting in God and what He's promised. So that the application is, have endurance. And, and He says, if anyone wants to be taken captive to captivity, He goes. If he's to be slain, He'll be slain. I think what He's doing here is they're just naming, this is what the beast that comes out of the sea can do. This is what a state that steps outside its bounds and starts to try to be like God, this is what they can do. They can put you in prison and they can kill you. That's it. That's the worst that can happen. And so he says, this is a call for endurance and faith. The, the power that, of a government that would array itself against the church is, is a government that can put people in prison and can kill people. And so he says not, right, take up a sword and fight. It's not a call to let's resist in every way that we can with violence, but a call to endure. I think what's happening is he's just naming the worst thing. Remember a, a friend of mine, he was talking about some of his philosophy on life, where he would often say that they have some difficult decision in the family, and he would always ask, what's the worst that can happen? I think at times frustrated his wife a little bit. Why are you always asking about the worst? And he said, well, tell me the worst. And if we can handle the worst, then great, right? Let's carry on. That's okay. The worst is all right. I think that's part of what John is doing here. He's showing us this is the beast of the sea. What can happen? Prison or death? Are we okay with that? Well... I mean, we'd prefer it not, but we're okay with that, right? That's the worst it can do. And so endure and trust in God. See, we can be tempted to give up in the face of 
of government overreach, right, of explicit persecution. We haven't faced that here, but we must endure. And that, that does mean that every Christian, we need to have clear in our own minds that by the grace of God, with the help of His Spirit, we say, I am willing to die because I believe in Jesus. That would be the right thing for me to do. Now, nobody quite knows how much courage you would or wouldn't have when somebody holds a gun to your head and says, tell me what you believe about Jesus, right? It might be arrogance to say, well, everybody else would fall away, but not me. But at the same time, with humility and trust in God, we should say with Peter, Lord, I'm, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And there's something of a relief in that. So have you, have you said that to your Saviour? Lord, I am willing to go with you into prison or into death. It seems to me that's still a wee way off here. But a decision that we all need to make. Are you willing to tell the truth? Are you willing to stand firm and endure because of your commitment to Jesus. I'm not here talking about uh, finding a way to annoy people so that they treat you badly, expressing yourself in a grating and ungracious way, uh, but actually suffering for the name of Christ. So I don't, as you probably know, I don't think all of the COVID stuff was necessarily an explicit manifestation of the beast. Um, I didn't like a lot of what the government did, but their goals were, were good and their actions consistent with uh, what they said, even though I think it was misguided at times. But I do think that we're on a collision course more clearly with a lot of the prevailing views of the day. And I don't know if we're going to end up with a beast of the sea type situation with explicit persecution of Christians or not. But there is a, there's a collision course, right? Uh, definitions of what a person is and what a male and a female is. There is a potential uh, battle on our hands there. But we have this, this warning and this call to endurance. And there's also a note of confidence, right? Your name being written in the land's book of life. See, the worst that can happen is we can die. And then we'll be with Christ, right? So if you follow the Lamb wherever He goes, you might have... Terrible things now and even death, but then you have life ultimately. So don't panic, but endure. So that's point number one. We must endure persecution if it comes to that. And then point number two is we must walk in wisdom. We must walk in wisdom. We must have skill in the art of godly living. And verse 18, it says, this calls for wisdom. This calls for wisdom. But how do, we, how do we get to that call for wisdom? We had the direct attack, right? The direct attack looks a little bit like, do you believe in Jesus with a gun to your head? And it's kind of clear, right? As to what your decision there is. But we have now the more indirect attack, the, the beast that comes out of the earth, which I think represents religious power, especially religious power that attaches itself to government of the day. So if you look there in verse 11, he says, Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. So again, that we have this parody of God, right? It, it looks, he's got horns like a lamb, but he speaks like a lamb, uh, a, um, speaks like the dragon. And so we have this parody of God. And, and, and in some ways it seems that this beast is a parody particularly of the Holy Spirit because it, you know, it gives breath to the image of the first beast. But you see there in your Bibles it exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence. And it makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. The second beast causes everybody to worship the first beast. And, and this is the norm when you have a government that starts to try to 
overreach and take the place of God. It's going to want to enlist religion of some kind to prop itself up, to, to give moral backing to what it's doing. It's almost, it's unusual to have an authoritarian government that doesn't have a, a moral or religious backing to come alongside it and to prop it up. They almost always have this. And we're told in verse 13 that it performs great signs, it makes fire come down from heaven to earth in front of the people. And by the signs that it's allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet live. So it sounds also a little bit like the church, like it's trying to look like the church. It sounds like it's trying to be like Elijah, who, who's able to call down fire from heaven. You don't know if you remember those stories. Elijah, uh, the prophet, not Elijah at the back, calling fire down from heaven on those captains of fifties who came. So he's a counterfeit of the Holy Spirit and of the church. Looks sort of like Christ, but sounds like a dragon. Wants to look like an agent of God. So he can deceive. And notice who it deceives again. Does it deceive those who follow the Lamb wherever he goes? No, it deceives those who dwell on the earth. Earth dwellers, those who don't follow the Lamb. See, the first beast loudly proclaimed blasphemy. Whereas the second beast, you look at it and go, well, maybe it's all right. It sounds a little bit like he's speaking some sense, right? And so those who go along with it are tricked and deceived. And uh, perhaps you can hear the echoes of where we read earlier of Nebuchadnezzar setting up this image and causing people to worship the image from the book of Daniel. Well, there's a lot more that we could say about that, but in verse 15... It says there it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Sounds a lot like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Not sure exactly what this uh, causing the, the image to speak. Uh, maybe it's miraculous or demonic activity. We're not sure. But this, is not, this would sound quite familiar, I think, to the original readers, where you would have a, a religious cult that would prop up the Roman Empire, right? You, you have to, in order to be a respectable part of the society, so that society doesn't break down, for the good of your neighbor, for, for good social order, and for the public good, it's fine that you have your little religion on the side, but you also have to come and offer some incense to show that you're on board. With, uh, with emperor worship. Oh, he's not really a god. He's sort of, we kind of deify him. You just need to show you're on board uh, so that nothing goes wrong in, uh, in the Roman Empire. Right? You have this pressure. Um, one writer said this, by the end of the first century, every city addressed in the letters, that's the seven churches, had temples dedicated to the deity of Caesar. Um, Ephesus in particular had a massive statue of Domitian erected. And there was pressure to take part in Roman worship. Ritual mattered. You have to do your duty so that society works. And so then the Christians will be on the outer. But notice what happens. This is not quite so much do this or die, though perhaps that might happen. Look in verse 16. Also it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is the name of the beast, or the number of its name. So then you have your religious or moral outlook now is connected to economics. So you have to get this mark, and if you don't have this mark, you can't buy or sell. It's going to cost you economically if you don't go along with this way of viewing the world. If you don't get on board with what's good for society, then you're going to suffer economic exclusion. Now this mark of the beast, uh, I believe it corresponds with... Uh, the seal on the people of God. And we're going to move on to that in verse 14, verse 1. 
you've got people who are the 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. So I think there's correspondence between the mark of the beast and the seal that the people of God are sealed with. And so, no, I don't expect that the mark of the beast is a physical thing that we see. I don't expect that because I don't think the seal that God's people have is this physical marking. So this mark of the beast means if you don't compromise with the worldly system, if you don't offer your sacrifice to Rome, or to the, the Roman emperor, then we're just going to have to put some economic things in place in order to encourage you to see things our way. So no, I don't think it's a vaccine or 5G or, or credit cards or those kinds of things. In the Roman world, you had to give allegiance to the empire, and you did this in a religious way. And it would free you at times economically. There were, uh, in later centuries, you could get a little slip saying, I have done my incense thing, so I'm okay with Rome. Right? I've, I've, done my, I've poured out an oblation, I've poured out some wine to the emperor. Look, I'm okay with worshipping the emperor and being on board with that. And if you're a Christian... Well, then you don't get that slip. You don't get the pass, right? You can't do it. And then we get finally to this call. He says, this calls for wisdom. And let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, or it could be, for it is the number of man. So there might, we could do it with no up man. And his number is six, six, six. Um... Lots of people have written lots about this number. For a start, it might be 616. So some manuscripts have 616, some have 666. I think 666 is probably better, but even uh, then that's in doubt a little bit. But the number of the beast, I think, corresponds to the mark of the beast. One popular theory that very smart people have is that this stands for Nero Caesar uh, in a way of sort of counting up uh, the, but you have to first take it from Greek and into Hebrew and then assign a number for each letter and then add them all up and you get 666 and it's Nero Caesar and that's who it's supposed to be talking about. Um, as I say, very clever people think that might be what's referred to. I was talking to Ben Hudson in Dunedin and he's quite smart and he thinks that's probably most likely. I don't think that's most likely because I think this was written in the 90s it was written in Greek, not Hebrew, and it's just, it feels too cute to me to add up those numbers, and it seems like you can get about seven or eight different names depending on how you do it. So you can also get Ronald Wilson Reagan, Reagan. don't know if you guys remember that at a time everyone was saying he is the, the guy from 666. So I don't think that's right. So most likely I think it's this. It's the number of man. It's one short of seven, right? Man is created on the sixth day, and it's one short of seven. And I think basically it means a day late and a dollar short, right? Not perfect. Not seven. But six. It's a sinful man who doesn't, who can't be Jesus, right? Who can't be perfect. And this, the mark of this beast is a, a mark of imperfection. But uh, I could be wrong about that if you want to really have an argument. I won't, uh, I won't be too nasty about your views on it. So I think what we have here is we had the direct attack, and now we have the indirect attack. It's religious and ideas and, and, and sounding like they're Christian and economics. And, and uh, one writer said this. I see we're, we're closing in on time, but one writer said this. His name was Doriani, Dan Doriani. He says, The Muslims in northern Africa tried to kill Christians and eradicate them and use holy wars against Christians, and it didn't work. But what did work was when they said that every Christian has to pay double taxes, and no Christian can hold a high office in the government, and Christians can't be in the military, and they can't have nice churches or public processions. And then he talks also about East Germany, and East Germany... Christians and the children of Christians were forbidden to go to university, no matter how smart, talented, or gifted they were. So this is the indirect method, and for some reason it seems like this works more, right? 
So if you're told, deny Christ or you die, it seems like Christians stand up and die. But then when somebody says, deny Christ or your children can't get into university, and we find that more difficult. And some uh, will turn away from Christ, those who are not truly His. So who is the second beast, I would say? Sounds like the Roman Catholic Church at points in history. The way that they align themselves with the secular power, they deny justification by faith. They use religion to prop up the power of the day. It sounds like many Muslim nations and Islam, except they get connected together, religion and the state, to resist Christ and Christianity. And perhaps here in New Zealand we're heading towards a situation, right, where we have uh, religious or moral ideas that are connected up to the state and economic pressure in order to turn us away from Christ. So what are we going to do with this? How are we going to think and live this uh, out? Well, we follow the Lamb wherever He goes. That's, that's one of the... I know there's been a lot of detail here. If you follow the Lamb, then you might get economic hardship, but you'll get eternal life. If you follow the beast then you might have economic gain, but you'll go the way the beasts go, both of them, uh, and it doesn't end well for them. So the church might face persecution or pressure, and we, we're tempted to give up or be deceived, but we must endure persecution and be wise. So to endure persecution, it means we are going to know our Bibles and know what's true, know what we can be flexible on and what, what we're going to stand on, and not move on at all. So takeaways. And let's close. First is endure. And that's just a decision I think that we need to make now. I would die for Jesus. And then second, be wise. Would I rather be wealthy and popular now and leave Christ? Will I go along with the message of the day? Do I love comfort and money more than Jesus? Am I being subtly drawn away from Jesus? Or will I be wise? Will I live in such a way that I'm following Christ now and I'm not little by little being turned away from Him? So we need to endure and we need to be wise. Amen. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, this is a challenging part of the Bible for us. It seems confusing and uh, lots of details, but we thank you for the things we can be sure of. That if we follow the Lamb wherever He goes, that we will have life with Him forever. And so, Lord, we pray that you would give us faith to endure, that you would, by your Spirit, give us uh, all that we need to follow you and for life and godliness, that you provide everything we need. We pray also you help us to be wise, that we might be winsome and gracious, uh, faithful and honest as we uh, proclaim Christ uh, in a society that increasingly uh, would rather that we didn't in all of its fullness. And so we ask for your blessing and your uh, grace in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to sing together now a final hymn, uh, All to Jesus.